couple of weeks ago, I'd asked Chris if he could give a word, to, and he, because of the situation at work, he's just running ragged over there at times, and uh, and so I asked me if he could do it today, okay, and and I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to give a little fourth, a little foretaste. There was a time, Chris and I have known each other how long now? 25 years. You're one of the first people I met when I came into town, okay, in 94. So however long that is, okay, 95. And did funerals with him when he was at Becker's. And, and Chris has been on quite a journey. I was going to tell it. But I'll never forget, just uh, on 5th Street, on the corner of 5th Street, is it Sexton? Is that where you work? His building was there. And Chris was fighting alcohol like you'll never believe. And I will tell you, at that time, I, never, I, I didn't know if I'd see him again. He was that bad. He was that bad. But then God did something to him. <laughs> and so here's his testimony to it. And you shut it off when I've gone too far, too long. That reminds me of, uh, is that too loud? Reminds me of what Dale Carnegie said, if you're going to speak, be dynamic or be brief. <laughs> so I had, uh, Russ and I, I'm working on an eye thing, so if I put glasses on and off, I'm, I apologize for that. I'm having trouble with my regular glasses, so maybe I will do that. And if you can't do the thing, Rusty, you go up and down all the time with this. So not long ago, uh, I can't recall if it was men's ministry or at an elders meeting, but uh, we were talking. I know Woody was there, and I think Sean was still with us in you, so it must have been an elders meeting. But we were talking about what we were passionate about and if we would want to talk about something that was in our life that we were passionate about. And since I, uh, and since I became saved, and one of the th things that I enjoy doing is reading the Bible, of course, which is uh, kind of a key element of all of that. Uh, one of my things is, one of my passion, my passion is discovering the truth. Uh, you know, I was born and raised into a Catholic family. Uh, I went through uh, Catholic school for 10 years, uh, St. Luke's School in Boardman, and then the Cardinal Mooney uh, through my sophomore year. In all of that time, St. Luke. There you go, I've got a long history there. Uh, through all of that time, I was never asked to open a Bible. Now, I'm, when I was a kid, I wasn't the greatest student. You know, I mind wandered and did mischievous things like all little boys, I guess, but I definitely know that I was never asked to open a Bible or study a Bible. Religion class, we, we did talk about Jesus and Easter and things that happened, but we, we never, ever opened a Bible. Uh, through my involvement in Holy Family for years, never opened the Bible. Uh, occurred to me one time, um, I was working a funeral service in a Protestant church, um, and a lot of times we will take the person, no lie in state, before the service and have the service in church, and every other denomination has Bibles in the church, mostly throughout the pews. Uh, you can't go to a Catholic church, I don't even know if you could find a, a Bible in the St. Nicholas, right up the street, they don't use it. They use their, their book of ritual. Uh, they do read the gospel. Um, and I'm, I'm not here to pick on anybody, but uh, to me it's just it's cafeteria style. You take what you want and you, you leave the cream peas. Um, anybody eat cream peas? I don't know. But uh, what I had uh, prepared to do today, you know, when we had, had talked about this, was talk about my quest for the truth. And then Rusty had... Uh, asked me to give a testimony, which is, and this is all kind of part of it, so I kind of mixed and mashed my message, and then I realized that it, it's pretty much the same thing. It wasn't until I went through very, two very, very dark times in my life, like I said, that I have ever read the Bible. I'm not sure if I was saved years ago. I have an older brother. I'm one of eight kids, raised in a very, uh, very Catholic family. Um, I have an older brother who's three years older than me. He became saved when he was 19 years old in the 70s. And back then, uh, and I'm just going to lay out some things and, and talk a little bit the way that we talked and phrases that were used. Back then, people that were saved, young people, 
call them Jesus freaks. You know, it's just that was a term that was rampant in the 70s. I'm sure, sure you've heard it. We uh, we kind of waited for him to come back around, and and uh, by God's grace, he never did. Uh, he stayed through. Uh, he uh, he stayed through the faith. Drug me to church with him a few times. One night, I I did feel touched, and I raised my hand and. Um, Felt like I was saved. I felt different for a while, but I, I certainly uh, didn't take long for an 18-year-old kid to wander back into the world. Um, wasn't like one of the Amish people that, that kind of went back home. I do know that five and a half years ago, I was with Rusty, and I, uh, I said the sinner's prayer with Rusty, and he helped me. And if I wasn't saved before, I knew I was saved that very day. And that was the very day that I surrendered my heart. And that was, uh, uh, I don't know if that was the day that I was saved, saved again. I think what I would refer that to is the day that I just accepted Jesus' invitation. That's the, that's the best way I could say that. I have a label with me that, uh, that I'll carry for the rest of my life. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, we're taught in the fellowship that I belong to that that's something that you've earned. You worked hard for it. You might as well use it. Right? Uh, that's a good thing. You know that that's a good thing. I've been sober for five and a half years. Uh, all thank you. All and only by the grace of God. And I can tell you that. Uh, there's ups and downs in my life like there always is, but it has been the best five and a half years of my life. So I'd like to tell you my story that got me there. Is that okay? Got me there and back. Or sent me there and back or, or brought me here. I am 55 years old, and uh, I got a, a late start in my drinking career. Uh, made up for it. Um, but uh, when... Uh, when alcohol got me, it knocked me around the first time, and it, it darn near killed me the second time. Um, please do not think that um, I'm exaggerating or making things up. I was a wreck. I mean, an absolute positive wreck. I uh, was very close uh, to drinking myself to death. Um, I'm not sure that I didn't try, and I certainly got to a point where I wished that that would just happen. Somehow through all of this, not a lot of people knew. You know, I had a very tight circle of people that knew, and then I, I decided at one point that you might as well share it. Like Jesus said, if you have a lamp, why hide it under a table? If you knew me as a kid in high school and through college, you would have never pegged me for somebody that was going to pick up a bottle. Uh, as a younger man, I was following chasing a boxing career. I did that for many years. I had a dream of uh, going to the Olympics. I trained every day, took care of my body. Probably didn't eat as well as we do today because we just didn't know so much about nutrition back then. It seems like we learn all the time. But I have a, had a dream of going to the Olympics and uh, almost made it. I had moderate success, but after several years and a few injuries, hand injuries and um, a spell where uh, I was having severe headaches every day. I took a review of my circumstances and probably made one of the more intelligent decisions of my young life, and I decided to uh, pursue a, a career and go to college. Um, one of eight kids, I'm number seven, there was no money left from my dad or my mom you know, to, to help me along, so I worked my way through school and went through night school and uh, got a job right across the street at the funeral home, cutting grass, washing cars, um, doing what we call removals, that's picking up bodies in the middle of the night. Um, they helped me. The, the Beckers helped me with a, Mr. Becker helped me tremendously with a working career that he let me work around going to school, uh, encouraged me. At the time he had, uh, well, he has five children, but at the time none of them showed any desire to go into funeral business, so he needed someone there so I went to, uh, went to college, and back then, um, I'm not going to bore you with a lot of the details, but back then you needed two years of college, and you got sent off to mortuary school. Well, I went through my two years of college, and 
he did me another favor. He said, look, I don't want you to go to school right now. I want you to get a degree. And he said, if in four years, after you have a degree, have your degree, if, if you think this is still something you want to do, then, uh, then I'll welcome you to do it. But I don't want you stuck in this rut. Uh, he was born into the funeral business. And unless you like that, that's not the place that you just walk into and say, hey, I'm going to do this. It's, it can be all-consuming. So I went to school and studied finance and economics and insurance. Uh, I don't even know why I picked insurance, but I uh, took a few courses, and that really got me. And uh, I decided after four years, I, you know, maybe the funeral home wasn't for me. I'd go into the insurance business, which I did for a little bit. But at the time, in the, in the 80s, people were buying pre-need insurance through a funeral home pre-arranging. It, it was a craze. You know, people were knocking the doors down to, to pre-arrange a funeral. I had an insurance license. They didn't, so it was a natural fit. So I went, uh, went back there and worked for them and got a funeral director's license and went through mortuary school. And uh, since then, I've been blessed to have uh, two careers. And as I talk a little bit more, you're going to realize I was really blessed that I'm able to keep two careers. Um, where I'm going, you know, with, with that in this part of my life, my, my wife has a profession. She's been in the jewelry business for 33 years. We were uh, what you would call dinks in the late 80s, early 90s, double income, no kids. Um, I can't speak for her. I can speak for myself. Material things were very important to me. Um, we lived a double income lifestyle. Uh, I don't want to say paycheck to paycheck because she's always had, she was the Linda in my life. She has a little more sense than I do. Uh, she, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but I was building a career, uh, accumulating things, and uh, probably the worst thing, I was building an ego. You know, I thought I was, thought I was it. I was a young kid, worked for a family business, um, and I can't say anything, but but good for these people. They've we've all come back together. We've mended fences, and they stuck by, me, stuck by me, and they support me today, uh, as I help them and support their business. But at the time, I was a young professional. I thought I knew everything. Um, one lesson that I learned is that I was not irreplaceable and my name was not on the sign, and more importantly, my name was not on the checking account. Uh, Dan Becker is a very good individual. Uh, he's been very good to me, but um, we clashed over a lot of things. His daughter had come into the business, and after showing no interest, became my boss. Um, but uh, long and short of it, I felt like I was irreplaceable, and I found out that I wasn't. Through all of this, you know, I'm, I'm part of the Rotary, I'm part of the community, I'm part of anything that could get my name somewhere, and uh, I wanted my name places, so I, could, I guess to feel important, I don't know. But through all of that came social events, came uh, evening dinners, receptions, cocktail parties, uh, uh, people with a lot of money, people that partied and drank, and uh, I don't know if I was making up for lost years, but I felt like I fit right in there. I, I was, that was something that, uh, it was just something that was important to me. But things were back and forth across the street. You know, we were at each other's throats a lot, you know, and again, I was replaceable. Families asked for me, you know, I was, uh, I was everything. I was nothing, believe me. So one day we came into an uh, argument, Mr. Becker and I, and we I'm, I'm really surprised to this day and thankful that we didn't actually trade punches. Uh, I remember leaving and I, I quit, stormed out, waited for him to follow me out to the parking lot and say, hey, wait a minute. He didn't. But uh, he's going to call me that night. That didn't happen either. So weeks went by and I didn't have a job. So I went back into the insurance business and went to work for a friend of mine with a, that had an insurance agency. By this time, I was disgruntled, I was angry, I was mad at life, I couldn't believe where I was. It, everybody's fault. Everybody was to blame for this but me. I mean, everybody. 
So my drinking was the only thing that I fell into. It was the only thing that made me happy. But after a while, that was just become my my life had become unmanageable. Um, my wife and I were arguing all the time. I wasn't rolling in the dough. People do that. Uh, I wasn't doing that anymore. You know, I was giving up some things, uh, working to make a car payment for this enormous boat rocket thing that I had to have, this Volvo that was about as long as this block. Uh, just stupid things, all these material things that I was, you know, and I just, uh, through all of this, I had this tremendous fear of losing everything. So my wife got so upset and angry, she said, look, you got to do something. So I went to, uh, you'll probably remember this, Rusty, this was years ago, checked into Neil Kennedy for, did the three-day dry-out thing. And I don't know if I, uh, I don't know if uh, I just needed a jump start in life, but uh, I quit drinking. Started to go to AA meetings. Uh, things started to fall into place for me. And the next six years, almost seven years, were just a whirlwind. I started my own agency. I had great success. I won sales recognitions, awards, and trips. I bought a second agency, and I was on top of everything. Again. You notice I keep saying I, I didn't do any of that. It took me a long time to realize that that was given to me. Um, I don't, I didn't know, you know, as, as, as I'll go on here in a minute, uh, I don't know why good fortune was given back to me um, because out of all of that with money and success brought trouble again. I had two partners that, uh, had done some shady things. I owned my own agency here, and I bought this second place with the two of these guys. And they were doing some things that weren't really copacetic. They're both out of the business now. Um, but at the time, they both left the business, and I had to, uh, I don't know what compelled me to be so honest. Thankfully, I was honest for the sake of my wife, for the sake of the people that work for me a responsibility that I just did not take seriously. Uh, but I was able to maintain our position where we were. The problem was is I had a business that has an enormous mortgage uh, and without two, two other people helping me with that, all this financial burden fell on me, probably doing much better without me than they ever could have done with me. I surrendered to the program. Uh, it's not a perfect program being a Christian and, and uh, I won't go into that, but uh, I started to do some soul searching, examining, and I started to pray. You know, um, I realized, you know, going through the Bible, which I had never read before, you know, you, you was looking for help, maybe not necessarily in the right places. There's one ma one mediator between God, and man, the man Christ Jesus. So Jesus was the only person I prayed to. I had to, we go through 12 steps in our program, and I had to admit the first step that I was powerful, powerless, powerless over alcohol in my life was certainly unmanageable. I'm not even sure that I had a life at this point. But uh, I did my homework, and I, I took this program by heart. I learned all the 12 steps by heart, which I never did the first time. And I really needed to do this because I needed something to focus, and I had to not think outside of the box. I had to think outside of the bottle um, for a long time. But uh, after a couple weeks, almost three weeks, you know, they decided to send me home, but I promised that I would go through this intense uh, uh, outpatient thing, which I did. But I remember going back to work the very first day, sitting in my office up the street there, and uh, we were up the street at the time, and I remember going there and sitting there, and I was going to make right of things, and then I remember sitting there shaking so bad that I couldn't write. And I'm thinking, my God, what happened to my body? You know, I uh, I thought my mind was clear. You know, I hadn't had a drink in like 21 days by now, and I, you know, I, I don't know what was inside of my brain. A friend of mine called, uh, an acquaintance. I, I guess I really couldn't call him a friend, but he owned a funeral home. And I, I stumbled around folks for about, a week and a half up there, and I, I couldn't do anything. 
uh, there was days where I couldn't even drive myself. I just couldn't get over the shakes, and I just couldn't explain this. I was afraid to go to the doctor because I was afraid to discover some great damage that I did to my body. But uh, anyway, this gentleman called me, and he said, hey, you know, my family wants to take me to California. We're going to have one more reunion. My wife has Alzheimer's. This might be the only last time that we could all be together. I need you to cover my funeral home. And I don't know what made me say yes because I didn't even know how I could transport myself there. Somehow I said yes and I, I snapped to attention and because I had something to focus on, uh, I got over the shakes and, and I was using my mind to do something that I've done a thousand times in my life. But I remember going there and one evening during calling hours there was a prayer service and I just opened up the pamphlet and right in front, of, in front of me was Jeremiah 29.11. For I know the plans I have for you, declared the Lord, plans for a future and hope. And I don't know why that stuck with me. Well, I know why it stuck with me, but at the time, I was just there and I thought, wait a minute, you know, game changer. This isn't over. Um, two days later, three days later, I started working... No, actually, i, I got to take that back. It, it was about a month later, Rusty came into my office, and I had been working with my sponsor, and we were setting up step, step five. Admit to yourself, to another human being, the exact nature of your wrongs. Rusty came in, and I said, hey, I have to do this this afternoon with Monsignor Connell, who, uh, from church, can I run this by you? So I ended up doing step five twice. I did it with Rusty. I don't even remember doing it the second time, because Rusty was there. And I have to say, folks, that that was the day that if, if a balloon could be filled, filled with the most rotten things, with despair, with dejection, with rejection, with uh, resentment, and you just let the air out of it, that's how it felt. And I'm quite convinced that that's the day that I finally surrendered. Um, that was a great day. I remember the sun was coming through the window at a certain day, and I just, uh, Rusty was there. And to tell you that I wasn't exaggerating about where I was, Rusty almost gave up on me. Uh, at least he told me he hasn't. Rusty never gives up on anything. <laughs> you know, just uh, George Carlin said, just because the circus has left town doesn't mean the monkey's off your back. <laughs> Rusty was on my back. Rusty had my back. But uh, he gave me the book, Experiencing God. And I never got to, one day I'm going to do this, I never got to get, go all the way through that. But I started reading that book, and my life just began to change immensely. Uh, we talk in our program about a higher power, and my higher power is Jesus Christ. Um, uh, you know, our our Lord and Savior. And I, I think about that every day and how, how fortunate I have to, to have that hope. That brings me to where I am, where I'd like to go right now, is to circle back to my passion for the truth and what is the truth. You know, for the first 50 years of my life, truth was void in my life because I didn't know what the truth was. You know, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And for me, that is the, for me, that's the most beautiful passage uh, in all of Scripture. And uh, there's others that stand out. There's others that guide me in certain directions and places that I need to go. Uh, but um, that's, to me, that's just the most beautiful verse. You know, Jesus is the, is, is the truth. And when I say that, that it was void in my life, it, it was because I didn't know Jesus and, and uh, I didn't know what truth was. As a businessman, I stretched the truth. In my mind, I denied the truth. In my marriage, I, I neglected the truth. I'm convinced that I'm married today because my wedding vows were more serious to my wife than they were to me. Today, I truly pray for and accept God's will in my life. And I think that uh, one of the most magnified gifts that God has given, or one of the greatest gifts that God has going on in my life right now is not quite the serenity. Serenity is a great gift, believe me, but one of the things that he's given me 
right now it is very important to me is this magnified conscience that I have, you know, to to do the next right thing, you know. You know, when, when I was a little kid, I couldn't wait for Saturday morning's cartoons. Anybody watch cartoons on a black and white TV? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Woody remembers stick figures on the walls of caves, yeah. but that's going way, way back. <laughs> but, but there, no, it never stops. But there is this cartoon, I think it was Fred Flintstone. He had a good conscience on one shoulder and a bad one on the other. And, and uh, I don't mean to make light of that, but, you know, certain things hit me through the course of the day, is this right, is this right, you know, who would know, you know, I, I, I work so hard, I'm driven so hard by God to be a man of integrity, and you know, to me, the, the true definition of integrity is doing the right thing even when nobody's watching. Amen. My marriage, because of my, my walk with, with Christ, my walk toward Christ, uh, it has never been better, and don't get me wrong, we, we, we ain't Ozzy and Harriet. I mean, there's days where I wonder what is she could possibly be thinking, and I'm sure there's days that she'd like to hit me over the head. You know, I, I, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm just so blessed to have her. I'm blessed to know that I'm loved by a God and Savior. I understand the meaning of serenity and the peace that could only, I have a peace going on in my life that can only come from God. There's absolute, and one of them has gone astray. Does he not leave the 99 on the mountain and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than the 99 that never went astray. Imagine, imagine someone that did the horrible, stupid things in my life rejoicing over me. The Savior of the world rejoicing over me. Folks, there's days that that's just, I'm in awe of that. And when I get that feeling, I, I try to hold on to it. Sometimes it slips away, and I gotta, I've got to remind myself. But I go to the bed every night knowing that I can't worry problems away. You know, I rely on God's, pro on God's promises. Matthew 6.27, what man could add a cubit to his stature from worry? You know, all of these mountains that I've been able to make into molehills, you know, go go in the opposite way. You know, my program of AA tells me to ask God to do His will in my life and give me the power to carry that out. You know, and uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, even though they've, you know, we, we, welcome, we welcome anybody that has a desire to stop drinking. Some of it, you know, they've stretched a little bit beyond my liking, you know, where um, we're afraid of the atheist, I think, a little bit, and the agnostic, and, and so forth. But uh, I love that. You know, give me the power to carry out your will. You know, experience, I've learned that experiencing fear and worry and anxiety, that's disloyalty to God. That's, bis that's being disloyal to a Lord and Savior that tells us not to worry. Don't get me wrong, events in life get to me, you know, every day. Inside the walls of this head, can be the best place to be. And I have to confess to you, sometimes it's the worst place to be. You know, I'm by myself sometimes and I'm surrounded by my enemies. And I, you know, I have to confess to you, and I, and I do this as an open confession, that, you know, I don't always practice what I'm preaching right now, but I get drawn back to it. You know, uh, I go stronger as time goes by, and, and I only do that by relying on the promises of God. When garbage fills my head, which happens a lot, you know, I, I try to replace it with good things. You know, light and darkness cannot exist in the same place. You know, I got dark, fuzzy cobwebs going on up there, but little, little bit of light. And you know, I heard not long ago the reason the, the reason that we should never fear shadows in our life is because there has to be light behind them to make a shadow. You know? Reach around the shadow, just like that kid did in the YSU game a couple of years ago. Reached around the defender and grabbed that ball. You know, the, the light's there. You know, I, I have to have to work on that. I, and I know I have to continue my growth. I'm not running a race. I have to remind myself of that. I'm walking through a journey. And I try, and I, and I want to. I want to heed the advice given by Jesus in Luke 7.24. 
everyone who hears my word and does them will be like the man who built his house on a rock. You know, I need that rock, you know. So, you know, for the first 50 years of my life, I was on sand, sinking sand. And, uh, I took weak sand and I dumped alcohol on it, which made it mushier and mushier and mushier and sunk down. You know, I've heard recently that repetitiveness is the closest we've ever come to permanence, the closest we will ever come to permanence. You know, I need to get that repetitiveness in my life every day. I, I'm a very compulsive person. I'm driven by habit. You know, I, I do the same thing day in and day out. And one of the things I have to get better at is, is uh, prayer life, prayer closet. You know, that repetitiveness and do it and do it and do it until it becomes permanent. I want my prayer life to be so ingrained in my daily life that relying on the promises of Scripture becomes prominent, becomes permanent. You know, once a sinner, always a sinner, we know that. You know, I, I know we can't wish our past away, but we can have hope. You know, I heard a pastor say not long ago, you should never use the phrase, I wish. You should say, I hold out hope for thus and so. I hold out hope that our Savior loves me. You know, I, I hold out hope, the hope, I have the hope that our Savior's forgiven us. And I'd like to close with a verse that I know is one of Linda's favorites and that brings great comfort to me, Philippians 1.6. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Now i got to do my, uh, my uh, best impersonation of Pastor Rusty. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Say that with me. Hallelujah, what a Savior. That's all I got.